On this episode, Ed and I dive deep into our early days in Bangkok to remember some of our most vivid memories. So whether you're fresh off the boat or a jaded expat like us, you'll appreciate this trip down memory lane. Sawadikrap, and welcome to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 because the Flaming Hosers motorcycle gang out of Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan, put a bounty on my head of 400 beaver pelts, and I had to get out of there. Man, those beaver pelts are hard to come up with. They are. I guess I didn't have anything to worry about getting 400 beaver pelts these days. is pretty hard. Probably could have stayed there safely for a while. <laughs> and I am Ed Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 23 years ago fell in love with the daily habit of making sure there wasn't a giant snake in my toilet, so I never left. Ha, <laughs> nice. You gotta be careful. We want to give a big thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get every episode a day early. Behind the scenes, photos of our interviews, a heads up to send questions to upcoming guests, and access to our Discord server to chat with me, Greg, and other listeners around the world. But best of all, patrons also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and Bangkok topics. On this week's bonus show, we chatted about Greg's work in updating his GPS-guided audio walking tours of Bangkok, my trepidation when it comes to making new friends at the gym and what I can do to break the ice, and the supposed deal Tay-Tay made with Singapore that prevents her from putting on a concert in Bangkok, which Greg and I, both huge Swifties, are very upset about. So sad about that. I'll see you next time, Tay Tay. <laughs> to learn how to become a patron and get all this good stuff, plus full access to over 700, that is not a mistake, 700 bonus <laughs> and regular back episodes, click the support button at the top of our website. Right. And as always, if you have a comment, a show idea, or just want to say hi, head to bangkokpodcast.com and click the little microphone button on the bottom right to leave us a voicemail that we will play on the show. Alrighty then. Well, on this episode, we take a cue from our buddy Vinny, who is thinking of making the move to Thailand in the not too distant future. Uh, he asked me the other day what my most vivid memories were of my early days in Bangkok, the things I remember most fondly or not fondly at all, and which I now look back on with amused nostalgia. It's an interesting question because obviously your first year or so in Bangkok is very subjective. Some people hate it, some people love it, others are somewhere in between. But those early days can really set the tone for the following months and years, so they are very important. So with that in mind, Ed and I thought we'd discuss some of our earliest and most vivid memories from our early days in Bangkok and see where it leads us on this little trip down memory lane. So Ed, what do you think of this? What do you think of Vinny's idea? No, I love the topic. Um, you know, I, I, I think sometimes we do too many shows that are like lists of advice. So maybe we should just get a little more... I don't know what the right word is like not emotional but but uh, yeah no i mean i it's okay just to talk about memories without trying to pull lessons out of them you know, like it's not it's not always about the lessons and um i guess so yeah you're right my um i've got very vivid vivid memories of my first year in in bangkok and thailand uh i've talked about it before but you know i came here older so and i'm glad i did so i came here in my early 30s and um I was just a lost lawyer and I thought I was going to be here for six months or maybe one year. Uh, and I, I came here not, I didn't come here to party. I had a good job lined up before I came, which I, which actually paid quite well. So I never had to do the visa run thing. So my experience is very different from yours and a lot oh. of other, uh, uh, expat or when I meet like you know you and I have a bunch of friends and a lot of our friends came in their 20s and you come to Thailand in your 20s and you don't have a lot of money and uh, you don't have a job and so you do what you can you know and then you you do the yeah. night you do the visa runs and 90 day reporting and th that is the typical experience of uh, of a guy here in their 20s well I skipped all that like I was older and I was already a lawyer and I just had my shit together when I came here and and uh, the company I worked for just organized all my paperwork, so I've never I've never done a single visa run in my life, 
not you one. Lucky bastard. You... I, I'm, I'm afraid to admit it to some other foreigners because they're like, oh my God, dude, I'm going to kill you. Because it's, it's, it's like, I skipped all that. That's how I feel just before I jump into the swimming pool. I'm like, ooh, it's only 26 degrees today. I'm like, a little bit, water's a bit cold for me. <laughs> but that's that was my experience too. And that's the, the overall memory of my early days here was just pure unplanned chaos. Like you never knew what was going to happen because you were always just trying to stay one step ahead of the visa man and the work permit guy. And you're trying to swing from one visa run to the next and hopefully with some measure of stability in the middle, but you never really knew what was going to happen next. Right. I know so many people in your condition, I mean, or your situation. I mean, even people like even, um, our, you know, our, our buddy from the last couple of shows, like David Cluck, not now things are more steady, but you know, w- when you come here on these film projects, you have like weird visa problems. Cause you're going to come, you're going to come here for three months and work. And Thailand is really strict about working. And so, like, like y- you could be making really good money and still have to dick around with the Thai government on paperwork. Right. And, uh, and I just, I mean, I honestly, I feel almost guilty about it. I skipped all that. Like, my company just took care of everything. So, but, but my point about my memory was that, you know, I didn't have to do any of that stuff. And, but, but my, ex- even though I was older, my experience was, of of almost being a freshman in college again because when i was a, <laughs> when, a when, when i was a freshman in college you know you go live in the dorm and i was at a good university and kind of a serious program but it's just a party seven days a week and it's just right. it, like like it is chaos so i think so i experienced the chaos but it was kind of different than yours like i luckily i didn't have any of the legal or or visa uncertainty like so many so many people i know they just have visa uncertainty where you know i meet people and they're like yeah i don't know if i'm going to I'm going to be here like in three months. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get a reentry permit or, you know, you know what I mean? Or be able to, you know, I, so I've just never had to deal with that, but man, uh, it was just a party. I mean, just, I just remember, um, so my first day, so I have a very vivid memory. My, my first day I woke up and, a a a guy that I became friends with who I worked with, uh, uh, a guy named Jason, he knocked on my door at, at my apartment, because my company had a bunch of uh, the teachers all living in the same apartment building. And he's like, hey, introduce himself. And then he brought me to the office. And so nothing was too weird so far. Like we go into the office and I'm meeting people. But then that night on my first day, he took me out to eat at Woodstock, which was in Nana Plaza. And I remember, so this is, so I've, I've, been in, I, I've been in Thailand for less than 24 hours and I'm already at Nana Plaza. And okay. All right. So it was just mind boggling and mind blowing. <laughs> like I, you know, obviously I'd been to go-go bars in the States before strip joints, whatever, but not a plus, it's just a different experience. It's like an overwhelming mm. thing. And we go eat at Woodstock, which is, uh, used to be in this American bar in the middle of Nana. And that day, the, the first day I got there, of course I met a, a cute Thai girl, shocking you're like so I haven't, even, <laughs> I haven't i haven't even been in thailand for 24 hours and i meet a girl and get, and got her phone number and um it was just it was just this overwhelming sensory thing i mean i was i was still jet lagged so i you know i i got in at right. like 11 p.m. and you know woke up at you know 7 a.m. and then went to the company did all the stuff and then he takes me out so i haven't even been in country 24 hours and i'm already dealing with like the chaos and the stimulation of Nana, and then I meet right. a girl, and then I meet a girl, and that was just that just was the beginning, and it just every day was like that. It was just an adventure. So, so I did come to Thailand. Um, I did come to have an adventure, but I definitely didn't. Co- I did not come here to party. I was much. I was. I was in my. I was thirty three. So I didn't come here to like cut loose or party. It wasn't right. like that. It wasn't like that at all. I came here because I was taking a break from being a lawyer. And I wanted to get some more world experience because I was very untraveled, like a lot of Americans. Like I traveled mm-hmm. within the U.S., but I never left the U.S. before I came to Thailand. So, no, I was, me neither. I, I'd never been out of Canada except as a kid when I when I lived in Australia. Yeah. But I'd never been out of Canada before Thailand. So I did come here to like you know, it, have an adventure, but I did not come here to party. Uh, right. But then it did turn into that where it, so it was <laughs> it, it was this it was it was wild. It was crazy. Uh, just. I, it felt like being a freshman in college again, where there, it was just there was something to do every night, like just some, some bar or some person was having a party, house parties. Uh, it was pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so, so 
but I, but I, but I liked it, you know? So I, at first I was a little bit worried about it. Like, Oh, Hey, I'm too old for this, you know? But then I just got sucked in, man. And I just, I just, I just went with it. <laughs> I just, I yeah. just went with it. <laughs> yeah. I miss those old house parties because you know, house parties are not a thing in Thai culture. And I remember this very vividly of my, uh, an ex, 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 ex girlfriend a long time ago. And one of my guilty pleasures is that movie can't hardly wait. It's one of those cheesy screwball teen uh, comedies from, uh. from the mid two thousands. And, uh, it's, I, I think it's so funny. And I showed it to my ex and she didn't really get it. And I was like, but it's all about this, you know, this big party where everything happens in one night. And she's like, sure. we don't really do that. Uh, <laughs> in Thailand. We don't have house parties. So I don't understand why this is such a big deal. And, oh, funny. You know, but, but as foreigners here, then we sort of import that house party, house party culture. Yeah. And, uh, they were fun, man. Just going over to random condos that people were renting and they were sure. always different and weird and. The, f- the funny know, thing is, is uh, you know, I-, I did not meet you straight away, but I did no. meet um, uh, a bunch of our current friends. Like within within my first month, I met a bunch of our still friends. Like most of them were still in Thailand, like guys like Derek and and people like that. I, I, right. I met I met within my first month in Thailand. Uh, yeah, like I said in the intro, man, those first few months or even longer, they can they can really set the tone for the rest of your time. Yeah. Um, and my my first few months here were actually really not very happy at all. I was very lonely. I was completely broke. I had just gotten hired as a teacher, right. and I was waiting for my first paycheck. And I gotcha. just I, I didn't do anything. I didn't go anywhere. And I was really like, this this kind of sucks. Have I made a big mistake moving here? But when I got my first job. And then I actually started to hang out with the other teachers. You know, that right. was the, the the foot in the door. Sure. And then your social circle starts to expand, and then everything is just dominoes. Dude, me. that's brave. You know, I, it, to be honest, like I, I, I mean, maybe it was somewhat brave for me just to try to come over here. But I really, you know, I was just older, and I was already a lawyer, so I'm, like I had my shit together. You know, I, I had an employment contract before I even got on the plane to come to Thailand and everything yeah, was just well, taken care of like work permit is all taken care of ahead of time. Like I was just, I was on an, <laughs> another, I mean, I met tons of Greg's at, at the time, like, like young dudes in their early twenties or mid twenties who, right. you know, basically had nothing, you know, they're barely legal, yeah, yeah. no money in their pockets. So I, I became exactly. very, I became very aware of that expat crew, but uh, I was, I, I was older and I don't know if I was wiser, but the bottom line is, I think I ended up doing a lot of the same crazy shit that like the younger guys did. I just got sucked into it, and I was a little bit, uh, you know, I was a little bit surprised at the time. Like I'm just like, wow, this is fun, you know. I, it was just <laughs> that it was fun, and I think part of it in my case was, um, I, the the previous couple years for me were, were were not great because I was kind of a lost lawyer. You know, I'd been a lawyer for five years or so, right. and I didn't want to do it anymore. But I, I didn't have a plan B. Like I, I didn't, right. I, yeah, I really, I, I was lost. I mean, I really was career lost. And, uh, the, the Bangkok thing was just supposed to be six months or a year of kind of seeing the world and like reassessing things. But I fully expected to go back and, and be some kind of lawyer. Those was what I fully expected. Um, Interesting. it's just, I fell in love with teaching, you know, I fell in love with teaching and then I fell in love with Thailand. Um, yeah. but, my, but I have these, I want to, I want to mention some specific memories. Some of them are, are, are classic that I think a lot of expats have, but I have very vivid, vivid, vivid memories of like late night tuk-tuk rides, like jammed in a tuk-tuk with a bunch of people. The tuk-tuk's yeah. going, the tuk-tuk's going too fast. It's like veering like left and right. There's motorbikes like whizzing past. It's like, and the lights are just like a streak and I'm, you know, I'm intoxicated like that. And I've, I've seen photos of that just capture this. Like, I don't have a photo of me, but, you know, this is the classic expat in Thailand photo when you're on one of these crazy tutu rides and you snap it and, and it's like the lights are streaked and there's a motorbike guy yeah, riding right. next to it and you're careening like left and right. Like, and you, you, know, you, you have this sense of, of danger and foolishness but you just don't care. You're just like, I was right. just, it was just crazy and fun. Well, you know, it's funny because I think this episode to, to maybe some of our younger listeners will come off sort of like two old guys ranting about their old days. And you and I talk about, oh, before the internet and before we had cell phones <laughs> and stuff like that. But that tuk-tuk experience, that's timeless, man. Like everyone, oh, yeah. people had that in the seventies and they have that now. Yeah, you're right. You know? You're right. It's funny. It's funny. There's a, a new teacher at my university who I've been hanging out with. And he wanted to take a tutu somewhere, and I was like, "Really? 
Like, because I don't ride two. Like, I just don't ride two tweets anymore. Are you a loser? Oh, you're new. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, but yeah, no, it's kind of fun. Like, but so I have vivid memories of that experience. Another, another vivid memory I have is just the insanity of lower Sukhumwit at night. And I feel like it's gotten better. Remember, uh, I don't, I can't remember when it was. Remember how at one point there was a big effort to clean up the stalls on Sukhumwit? Not now. There's much more walking space than there used to be. Um, yeah, right. Like 20 years ago, Sukhumwit, there there was no regulation, so you could like the the sidewalks were just full of stalls. So yeah, it it was almost bars like bars set up on card tables and that's right, bars on card tables and and and. and so it was almost guaranteed to be jammed with people because there was like a, a, a single practical single or maybe double file line. And so yeah. any any time after really 8 p.m., like 8 p.m. till 4 a.m., Sukhumit was chaos, man. Like just yeah, it was. jammed with people with like food. Like there's like food and people selling stuff and like and like, you know, and it's like the the selling stuff could be something completely normal tourist stuff and then like you know crazy like you know like sex toys and like so it's like right just, just it's total insanity it's a completely unregulated and uh i spent a lot of time on on lower because i lived on soy one soon but soy one and so lower Su- stumbling distance for you yeah lower soon but has like you know it obviously has nana and all that stuff and there used to be soy zero that we talked about recently right. on a show uh and i just have these vivid memories of of struggling through those crowds going into bars or, or sit or late night sitting at, like you said, one of these like little mini bars, like on plastic stools outside because the bars would close down, but then you could just sit on the sidewalk and, and drink and eat. Man, yeah. I, I did that a lot. Lower heady, Sukhumit. Heady days of lower Sukhumit. Lower Sukhumit. It's, I mean, it's still pretty wild to be honest. It's still pretty wild. Uh, but back then it, it, it's not so much that it was wilder, but it was, Definitely less organized and, yeah. and and more jammed. When was that? Do, do you remember? Do you remember when? When was it that they they got better about regulating the sidewalks? I feel like it was about ten years ago. Remember how there was a big debate about this? There was a debate about should we clean up the sidewalks or not? Yeah, because they thought like that'll take away some of the, the, the chaotic right. charm of Bangkok that That's people right. come here for. That's right. You know, but there is a fine line between chaotic charm and then. Night, taking nightmare. 15 minutes to walk 100 meters because it's you can't step anywhere because those sidewalks are so crowded with people. That's how it was. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, lower Sukhum, it was, uh, yeah, it was inefficient would be a good way to describe it. Uh, Very good way to describe it. But, but it, and, and, and I, I prefer it now. But am right. I just being old? Like, am I just sort of like, well, now the sense of order is nice. Yeah, no, I, I definitely prefer it now. But I, I remember just having to wrestle with that. Um, <laughs> and in a way, it's... Um, you know, my, another vivid memory I have is just various markets. I I don't know what it is. I I feel like in the states, uh, I the the only analog to like the Thai market that I can think of where I grew up is something like a like a county fair or or I don't know. I just just like the Thai market. So obviously Chato Chuck. So I went to Chato Chuck my first few months here, yeah. and and, and Chato Chuck is. In a way, it is like lower Sukhumi, but it's more like it's it's like two p.m. in the afternoon, and it's it's one hundred and fifteen degrees Fahrenheit, you know, and you're crowded. I haven't been there in years, you know. Um, but e- even things like uh, Suan Lum Night Bazaar, just just the the colors, the the smells of Thai markets. That's another thing that I just didn't get in the states. Obviously, I know it exists in the states, but it just wasn't part of my right. suburban life, like the like. Basically, something like JJ. I know. It, I know stuff like that does exist in the states, but I, I, I didn't. I don't spend a lot of time there, or, or don't remember that. So to me, that was a very Thai thing. Like the markets. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. The markets yeah. are a Thai thing. Like Suan Loom was more organized than JJ, um, but it was still kind of that rows and rows and rows of this kind of shop and that kind of shop, but with no rhyme or reason to any of it you know, trinkets and clothes. and I do miss those. Yeah. Some of it is yeah. touristy. And then, of course, like a food court, the outdoor food courts, the beer. I remember my first uh, December when they started setting up the beer gardens. 
oh, uh, yeah. at, at, at Central World. Um, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, a lot of memories of like sitting around drinking a lot of beer with like those, those beer towers. Yeah, I'm sure. kidding. You know, my, a lot of my first early memories sort of solidified around the community that came from the apartment that I was living in. And this is an apartment that I didn't choose. I was put there by my first job when I showed up and they, you know, while I was waiting for my first paycheck, they said, oh, we put all of our teachers in this apartment. We'll pay the first month and then you pay us back when you get paid, you know? Uh. And it was it was Union Tower on Petbury Road, which is just across from where Tong Law ends and meets Petbury. Okay, no, I remember I, I, I went to that place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah, you and I knew each other way back then. Yeah. Um, we, we called it Union Palace because it was the only thing we could do to sp- Bruce it up a bit, but it was a weird place. I remember my my apartment cost six thousand baht a month. It was a living room and a bedroom with a little tiny balcony, and uh, it was all, all you know. For our patrons, we'll put some photos in here of, of some of these early days, these early tuk tuk rides, and I'll put a photo of my my apartment in there. And I'm telling you right now, don't make fun of my my sassy girl poster that I had on my wall. It is a classic <laughs> Korean movie, and I love it. But um, it just never occurred to me that I could move out of this crappy little condo that I had. And I just, I stayed there for way too long. I was there for like four years. Oh, really? And it was a, it was a weird out of the way building. It was inconvenient. It was run down and old. Uh, did have a swimming pool on the roof, which was nice, but I just stayed there and I never really considered like, Hey, I can move somewhere. But the people that were also there with me, we formed like this proto community and uh, those, you know, those friends you make, they really help you through your early days. Like, the, like I mentioned, the coworkers, but there's also the people you meet in your condo as well. I do actually remember movie posters on your wall, but I don't remember what the movie posters were. Yeah, I had one of Moulin Rouge as well, also an early favorite. I didn't have a lot of uh, options for decorating my wall, but you did know, you also now, have a, I don't know. Am I going crazy? Am I going crazy? But did you have, did you have like Star Wars characters or some kind of like? I can't remember. You had some other type of trinket or some movie things, right? Tons of movie trinkets and stuff. Yeah, all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was a bizarre place. But, you know, now, I don't know if you've seen this, Ed, because you spend a lot of time on YouTube. But on YouTube, there's tons of videos where this guy, I don't know who they are, these guys are interviewing people in Bangkok. And they're all like, how much do you pay for your condo? Can you give us a tour of the facilities in your condo? And, man, things have gone upscale in Bangkok because these places are nothing like the crappy old rooms that we used to live in. So oh really? These guys yeah. are like fully kitted out, beautiful new condos. Oh of course, shit! Paying yeah. a lot more than six thousand baht a month, but anyway, those early days, man. Those condos can can set the tone. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the thing about um, you know, let's say, so you you were in kind of dire straits, right? But what you find you out, know, I wouldn't when call you- them dire straits, but I just didn't really understand that I that living paycheck to paycheck with five dollars in my bank account at the end of the month was not cool well no whatever no my point was going to be that you know when you're in a situation like that the simple truth is there's always other people in that situation so no matter how like so you you you, as long as you're reasonably outgoing and you make connections you kind of feel normal like it doesn't matter that much that that you don't have money in the bank or you're aware of it yeah you're aware of it but you're not hanging out with people with like tons of money you're right. kind of you're around people in the same situation as you, so it's 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 life still seems good, dude. I, I gotta mention this because uh, I, I do remember that in my first year living on Sukhumvit, I it was hard for me to get my head around like the bar girl scene on on Sukhumvit. Like it definitely was a thing that fr- freaked me out, and I found very bizarre. And just like I told you on my first day. I was in Nana Plaza going to go-go bars. And I remember my buddy who I was there was trying to explain to me what was going on, you know, and Uh he's explaining to me like what a bar fine is and all this stuff. And I just couldn't, I just could not process it. (laughs) You know, you know what I mean? It's like, even though I knew what, you know, Thailand has a certain reputation, it's just, I was, I just wasn't prepared for it. And I remember my first few months, I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, figure out what was going on. And, and I remember, uh, well, luckily, just to clarify, I actually, the, the girl that I met the first day I arrived, I dated her for a couple of months. And right. then uh, I actually met someone else who I ended up dating for three years. So I ended up having, uh, luckily, I, I I actually came here single, but kind of met people straight away. 
we, so so I didn't have to. The whole bar girl scene, it wasn't something that impacted my life directly. No, uh, I never I never dipped my toe into those waters either. Yeah, I mean, l- luckily I, I I mean I I I think I was lucky enough to avoid it. But I but I did I did find it fascinating and weird, and it took me a long time to understand it. And I remember being at these bars on Sukhumvit where. Uh, I, I did enjoy sitting with girls and buying them drinks and just asking them questions. Like, I, I feel like when, when I think back, I, 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 I feel like I was almost in graduate school. Like I, I, or I feel like I was a graduate student because I just didn't understand what they were doing and where they came <laughs> from and like how. So I spent a lot of time. It's where I got a lot of my basic tie. Uh, yeah. was was those <clears throat> nights where I was just trying to figure out what was going on with all these girls and you know we've talked about it before it's just it's just not part of our background not part of our history no and it takes a while so I, I do have very distinct memories of that and just trying to get my just trying to wrap my head around what was going on exactly yeah understand the economy of it all and the the social where, where in the social strata this yeah fits, the motive you know, like and, the motivations and and the fact that there's no cops around and I'm you know I can't it doesn't make any sense by Western standards and I right. remember going I remember going to go go bars in um in Nana and I'm and the first thing I said to my buddy was like well, where are the bouncers <laughs> and you, you 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 go into a strip joint in the U S and there's a giant like several giant dudes like overlooking right. the whole thing. Like right there, you know. Although and, I will say, I was in a bar in Nana one time, and I was showing a friend out of town uh, around a little bit, and he took out a phone and tried to take a picture. And within two seconds, there were two guys right there. Like, oh no, there put are that um, away right now. Yeah, so no, I mean, I'm not saying there are no guys present, but for but there's there's no big bouncers like leaning yeah. over you or watching you. I mean, they're, they're checking much your ID more, through the door and like yeah. giving you the stink eye. <laughs> they're much more hidden and much more surreptitious. Uh, I don't know. It's just a different experience, but I, I got to right. be honest and say that that was a. I do have very, very distinct memories of, of, of just being bewildered by by that whole world, and it took me a right. while to figure it out. Yeah, well, you know, earlier we talked about how you, you meet other people who are in the same financial situation as you are, and you form this little desperate community. But I have a really, really vivid memory. Of, of this when I strayed outside those boundaries. And I may have mentioned this on the show at some point in the, in the years past, but I randomly met this dude named VP. And okay. he was a, a, a really nice African guy, big black African guy. And uh, and he's like, he's like, you and me should go out sometime. We should go to a party. And I was like, yeah, because I was trying to make friends. I'd been here about three or four months at this time. Right. And I was like, yeah, sure, that sounds good. And he said, meet me at the Novotel Hotel Siam on Friday night or something. I'll take you to a Sure, party. I remember so, that. Yeah. Right, sure. And uh, so I showed up at Novotel. I'm wearing like, you know, my my Columbia sne- uh, sandals, my my backpacker sandals <laughs> and my sun-faded backpacker shorts and a t-shirt, which is all the only clothes I had at the time, except my teaching clothes. And uh, so I met him there and he was wearing, I remember he was wearing a bright red and black pinstripe suit. And oh, shit. Like, and, and, and he had like <laughs> big, big, black rimmed glasses on he looked like a pimp like a like a superstar pimp right oh wow that's so funny let's 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 go so we've got a taxi i don't even know where we went man i wish i had a picture of you two (laughs) you you two must you two must have been quite quite a pair (laughs) chalk and cheese as the brits say um (laughs) but i don't know where we went but we went to someone he knew and they worked for the un oh and we went we went to a house party and it was a backyard party oh okay and I'm not gonna. I'm, I, it's the main show, so I can't use the, uh, the the expletives we normally use in the in the bonus show. But the people I met that night who worked for the UN were the biggest bunch of pricks I have <laughs> I have ever met in my life. And this is 22 years ago, and I I still am bitter about it. They were just the worst people. They were the most arrogant, uptight, stuck up, entitled dipshits that I have ever met in my life. And it really left a bad taste in my mouth for NGO workers. Oh, wow. I I know a lot of people who work for for NGOs and the UN and they're lovely and a lot of them are my friends. So obviously this is not a blanket statement. But that night I was just like, man, I do not belong in this crowd. These are not my people. 
Interesting. Yeah, it's funny. I I, I, can't, I know what you're talking about. I haven't I haven't had it exactly the same experience, but I kind of know what you mean. I think there is um, there's something about working for the UN that it's just it's very easy to act self-important and pretentious. Right. It's just and a lot of the people that work there are super well educated, and then they. They go to work for the UN. I, I'm not sure what's going on, but I, I've, I've experienced some of what you're talking about. But uh, like like you, I also know a bunch of super cool NGO people. So yeah, we should yeah. we shouldn't generalize. But no, but th- those experiences are important. Um, like the bottom line is, I think the you know I think what was happening there is you were just running into people in different points in their life, and they were in Thailand doing totally different things than you were doing. Yeah. And and you were younger and kind of full loose and fancy free. And they're like, they have these like serious careers and they're serious people. You know yeah. what I mean? I remember them asking, what do you do? And I, when I said, I'm a teacher, you could almost hear their eyes roll and like, oh, I got to be over there now, you know? And oh, geez. Away. Right. Yeah. But it was my first exposure to that that social strata, that NGO worker, right? That fat expats package that that some people are lucky enough to get. I didn't know anything about it, um, but right. that, <laughs> that was how I learned about it. Well, the weird thing about NGO people is like a lot of them make nothing, but then there is a higher str- strata. You know, there is the, like the, the, the irony of the whole thing is that there are NGO people like you and people who make really good money that could rival like private corporation money. So you're right. There, there is like a yeah. elite, elite NGO uh, strata. Yeah. Well, those, that's who was at the party apparently. So I just was like, well, the hell with everyone here. I want to become one of those people and make their kind of money, but I'll be nice. So I want you to know right. that if I if I ever accomplish that goal and I'm at a backyard party and I see a random dude dressed like like a backpacker on Kyle's Hunt, I'm going to be really nice to that guy. <laughs> yes, yes, because he is an avatar for my early days. <laughs> I'll be like, you, that's you, a young Greg right there. You have the opportunity to, to, to color his first experiences with Bangkok and leave a positive taste in his mouth. I'll be super friendly to him. And then he'll be like, what's up with this old guy? Like being so friendly to me. <laughs> these, these UN creepy, people are these weirdos. They don't people. want anything to do with them. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> anyway, that's just some thoughts from Ed and I of our early days. And uh, like I said in the intro, this is all very, very subjective. And our memories from 20 years ago are very different from someone's memories today with your cell phones and your TikToks and your Instagrams and stuff. So uh, That's right. I think I think there are some some ageless experiences like the tuk-tuks and the yeah getting lost. And uh, yeah. I think it's, I wanted, it's a really interesting topic. Yeah, I wanted to do a show where we didn't give advice. Like I just wanted to just reminisce. So I hope yeah. listeners, I hope, I hope you enjoyed our, our random reminisces. And hey, listeners, if, if you do have any uh, these vivid memories from back in the day, if you've been here years and years, uh, let us know. We'd love to hear them. They're, they're so, so For sure. Everyone's got some interesting stories about Bangkok. For sure. All right. Well, we ask our listeners to send us a voicemail using the little microphone button on our website if they have something to say. And this week we heard from our pal, Joe. Take it away, Joe. Holy smokes. This high context, low context thing that you just talked about is truly amazing. And although. I thought you did a good job describing it. I don't think you did a good job explaining how one can implement the knowledge that that exists. So like many people, I'm a Farang with a Thai girlfriend, and this is a mystery. If You could have a whole show on this. Maybe there's an expert somewhere that you can get on the show to help people figure out how to navigate it, how to be prescriptive rather than descriptive. I uh, love the show, by the way. I've listened for a couple of years, and I'm um, bye. Oh man, I love that feedback. Um, the the whole high context, low context thing was a major breakthrough for me in Thailand and helped me understand what was going on. So maybe we'll have to get back into it and maybe do a better job of explaining it. But um, yeah. I, I I think I think it's a really important thing, and for me, it 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 helped me understand a lot about what was going on in my experience here. Yeah, I got to say, man, you talking about it, I think that was probably the second or third time I've ever heard the phrase, but I've never I've never learned about it or looked it up or, or read into it, but I would like to because I think it's a it sounds like something that you can really build yeah. a bedrock understanding of Thai culture. Yeah, we got to go deep. So we'll we'll do a high context low context show. We we promise. Who would talk about that like a, a sociologist? A social sociologist is probably the best. Like mm-hmm. some type of cultural studies person. I'll ask at my university. I'll see I'll see what I can come up with. 
Yeah. And listeners, if you know anyone who might be uh, a good guest to talk about this and let us know. And uh, thanks for the feedback, Joe. We're glad you liked it. And maybe there's some good books out there you can read in the meantime. It might take us a while to find a guest to talk about it. <laughs> but we'll get, we'll get back to you. All right. A final thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping in our never-ending quest for cool content. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We're Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Oh yeah! You can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can send us a voicemail through our website that we'll feature on the show. Hit me up on threads at BKK Greg. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hope you're doing well out there. We'll see you back here next week. For sure.